heart of the city Where the sun refused to shine People tell me it ain't no use in trying My little girl, you're so young and fresh And one thing I know is true Gonna die before your time is due See my daddy in bed is dying See his hair turning gray He's been working and saving his life away I know he's been working, yeah, every day Good afternoon, everyone. Today's special guest is Terry McIntosh. Now, this is Terry's book, and it'd be really cool if you could go and get it. Now, Terry's story is a very interesting one, and it revolves around something which is still um, a little bit, a little bit touchy. Um, but first of all, Terry, I'm reading your bio here, which you sent to me, which is really helps me out. Uh, so the youngest green, green beret, a true story set in the Mekong Delta. So can we start off there? I mean, it says here that you uh, you uh, joined the army when you were 17. And uh, so first of all, what made you join the military? Well, when I was 17, um, I was kind of a wayward, aimless teenager and didn't have and ambition, I had dropped out of school. And uh, of course the Vietnam War was raging. And uh, so it was an opportunity for me to serve the country. And I felt like it would be the right thing to do to you know, participate. So I enlisted. And so um, did you uh, like, uh, we'll start off at the beginning, whereas uh, did your father serve in the military or your grandfather? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of anyway. Uh, I know my father didn't know my grandfather possibly, but I'm not aware of any, any history there. Okay. Um, I know as a young boy, you know, I used to play soldier and, you know, cowboys and Indians and things like that. So I always had an interest in the, in the military aspect of things. And, uh, but as I was growing up, I dismissed those notions of course. And, and, uh, you know, just living life as a, you know, like I said, a wayward teenager and uh, uh, without any ambition. But but when the war was, uh, you know, it was increasing, getting worse even, uh, you know, I just felt like it would be the patriotic thing to do. And and uh, I certainly had the time to do it. And so during this time when you were at uh, at high school, were there other friends in your peer group that had joined up? Uh, a good buddy of mine, his name is Thomas Cole. He and I joined together on the buddy plan, which uh, we understood we would take our basic training together and, you know, before being uh, shipped out to our individual assignments. And, uh, you know, this is in the old army, Jason, and uh, sometimes it didn't go like you planned. Uh, so we enlisted and we got to Fort Benning for basic training and I didn't see him again till graduation. So, <laughs> so much for the buddy plan. So just so everyone knows, this morning we've had, or this afternoon, we've had a, some technical, can't even say it, technical difficulties, but we've been, am, we've been able to bring this to you. So if you see Terry uh, with the camera, he's actually holding his uh, laptop. So, but uh, we're going to bring this to you the best that we can. So, um, so the buddy system, um, that's something I've never heard of. So uh, could you just tell us a little bit more? about that so if you join with a friend that you would hopefully be through basic training and and then what yeah well you would be separated after basic training oh, I see. The, the idea and the way it was pitched to us uh is that uh you know we would uh, be together through boot training okay and uh that was the extent of it but of course it didn't happen that way right we were so, both at the same company but not together not at right. all. We didn't see each other, I don't think, until graduation. <laughs> so. Okay. So then it says here um, that, at seven, that you're still 17, and then you 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 were assigned to an elite long-range airborne, airborne um, unit in Germany. So whereabouts right. in Germany were you based? Well, it was in Frankfurt. Uh, that happened after uh, 
basic training. I went to Fort Lewis, Washington for advanced infantry training where I earned uh, an MOS there, but I volunteered for airborne jump school. And after I completed that course back at Fort Benning, then I was assigned to Company D, 17th Infantry, Long Range Patrol, Airborne Unit in Frankfurt, Germany. And uh, that company is the forerunner of Company A, 75th Rangers. You know, it's funny because um, my stepfather, he's he's also a, a veteran. He was uh, in Germany during the Cold War. He was in the Air Force. And, um, but he was telling me that when he would go to the local dances, uh, there were hardly any men his age or not, you know, um, and he was amazed on how many men had been killed during World War II, you know, of that, of that bracket. But yeah. I guess it was, a, you know, I mean, more, more, more girls for him to dance with, I guess, right? So, well, yeah, you look for the positive. Yeah, you, yeah. You, know, so, you salute those who lost but their lives, but uh, you look for the positive in everything. Yeah. And so now uh, you're in Germany and you got to hear about or see, learn about the special forces and that kind of stuff. So what attracted you to uh, the special uh, special forces? That's that's what's so unique, Jason. Nothing. <laughs> I mean, I, I, w I was content being a long range patrolman uh, and just jumping out of airplanes. That's all that I was looking at. And uh, I did want to go to Vietnam. I did volunteer to go to Vietnam, but I didn't volunteer for special forces. Now that won't work today. This is 1968. Uh, special forces is still, you know, as we know it today, it was still relatively young. Uh, they were short of personnel. And um, part of that was because, you know, of losses incurred during the, uh, the famous Tet but they needed qualified people to fill critical positions. And the uh, minimum age requirement to join special forces is 21 years old. And the average age of the Vietnam special forces Green Beret was about 30, 35 years old, somewhere in that range. Uh, I was 18 and they temporarily lowered the age requirement to 18 looking for qualified people to fill critical positions. Well, it turned out that I did. And um, so when I volunteered for Vietnam, they looked me over and I qualified, I fit their uh, uh, requirements. And so I was assigned to special forces. I've always wondered if I couldn't have gotten out of it, you know, because it was a volunteer unit. But I mean, what young soldier would, say no to that opportunity to serve with you know an elite group like that so so i embraced it and so then uh it says here that you, that you uh during this time that you that you that you passed both mental and physical uh tests um and you later uh, earned your your vietnamese jump wings um so this is this is kind of interesting so this qualified you in three different countries Right. Yeah, you know, I was airborne qualified here in the United States. Okay. Uh, then I was qualified in Germany. And then uh, jump wings in Vietnam made three countries airborne qualified. So would you, uh, just for the, because I don't know this part of the history of it, you would have to qualify in each different country that you, that you, that you served in, or it just so happened for you? It just so happened for me. Okay. Yeah, it's, not, right. it's not a requirement, no. All right. As a matter of fact, most uh, most airborne qualified troopers who served in Vietnam did not actually jump in Vietnam. Okay, yeah, because I mean, like, it's uh, I, I tell anybody who wants to uh, you know do these kind of uh, or go down a you know historical path, it's very difficult to know everything. No matter how many books you read, and oh, that's true. You know, and if you were to read all the books that I have behind me and in front of me, uh, I see those yeah. you know, that you would think, I mean, and I haven't, I haven't read them all. I'd be lying. Yeah. Um, but you still would learn things from people like, like yourself. It's not until you speak to the veterans, right? right. So here's where we get into some real nitty gritty. Now the nitty gritty of this is this was probably one of the uh, events during the Vietnam War that was dragged through the press and uh, really was trying to make special forces, especially the special you know projects, look bad. 
And um, I'm not going to mention his name, but there's another, uh, there's a SOG gentleman that I was talking to about this project. And he said, um, that's something that I don't wish to talk about over the phone. So whenever you um, cross that line of uh, anything to do with CIA, people get a little bit hesitant um, still to, to this day. Um, and from my background, you know, uh, work that I've done, um, researching the military aspect of anything to do with SOG or special things with the army, uh, there's a lot of information. But when you start going down uh, the rabbit hole with CIA, it's, it's still a little bit closed. So I'm gonna hand this over to you because, um, you know, and again, thank you for talking to me because uh, I really don't know too many people who would be uh, interested in talking about this or feel comfortable. So, um, so I'm just gonna read this first line and then if you can give me or us the, the rest of the information. Terry was entrusted with top secret clearance um, you know, assisting with, with uh, Project Gamma team members as needed. Um, a covert operation that ran secret ops in, into, into a Cambodia with a double agent. So I'm gonna leave it there. Okay. Well, first of all, let me be clear that when I left Vietnam, uh, arrest had just been made regarding the Green Beret affair. And um, I was uh, interrogated or not interrogated, just interviewed, you know, as I'm leaving uh, Vietnam. And I did have to sign an affidavit saying that I knew nothing at all about any secret operations uh, running out of our camp. And uh, the option I had was to say, well, sure I do, and still be in Vietnam today, probably. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I came home uh, as a soldier under orders not to talk about it. But that has been how long now? Yeah. 50 years. Nobody cares anymore. Now, I understand the need for continued secrecy where um, certain things should not be revealed today. And I understand that not everything about Project Gamma has been revealed yet. Now, I don't know that for a fact, but that's what I'm told. And um, But my limited knowledge of the affair isn't anything that, you know, would uh, upset anybody anywhere. So it's not a problem for me to talk about it at all. Um, as far as uh, uh, the incident itself, my team, it was an A team, and we were a small 12-man team, and uh, we set out near the Cambodian border. We were about, uh, the main camp was about three miles from the border. Our forward uh, operating base was, you know, 1,500 feet from the border, and uh, that's where I spent an awful lot of time there, and where I met the agent, actually, the double agent. But uh, our goal there of, was, of course, to maintain that area of operation and keep it free from Viet Cong activity. And uh, we would, of course, serve as a buffer if there was a, a massive attack, you know, coming across the line there. We'd be the first to encounter that. And uh, so all that was part of, you know, our operation. In addition to that, because of our proximity to Cambodia and um, uh, the continued buildup of North Vietnamese and Viet Cong troops uh, in Cambodia, uh, Project Gamma assigned three operatives to our team. Now, they were not a part of our team. We were not a part of their team, but they were three men assigned to our team and uh, Robert Morasco was the commander of those three. He, um, he managed uh, an indigenous spy ring uh, working inside Cambodia. And uh, one of the goals of Project Gamma, of course, was to keep tabs on enemy movement and troop buildup. And uh, when the uh, secret bombings that President Nixon started in Cambodia, you know, it was also to pinpoint targets for those attacks. Uh, our team simply provided them a place to live, food to eat, and we assisted them on a need to know basis. And uh, sometimes I was called upon to help send intelligence reports back to 
those who needed those reports. And that was my involvement and connection with it. And so this, I mean, uh, I, I guess if I were to dig, I mean, well, I'll start again. The, the agent in question, his, his name is is out there, um, of course. Sure. I, I have seen a picture of his uh, of, of his widow and, and the, the child there in, a, in an older newspaper. Um, in some articles I've, and we'll get, this might be confusing people a bit, and we'll get to what happened to this double agent shortly. Um, in some articles I've read that they refer to him as a triple agent. Um, yeah. Can you can you elaborate on that? Because I'm sure people uh, you know are going triple agent. How can someone be a triple agent? But yeah, well, uh, his name was Chu Win. That's that's the way it's pronounced, Chu Win. I've heard it a lot of different ways, but that's the way he pronounced it, Chu Win. And uh, of course, a double agent, of course, is somebody working for two sides. And right. that would have been that would have been, of course, the uh, He's working for the United States, and he's working for the North Vietnamese or Viet Cong, right? That would be a double agent. Speculation has placed him also as an agent for the South Vietnamese government, separate from, you know, our connection with him as Americans and, of course, from the, the enemy. So if that was true... And nobody has ever provided any proof of it at all. It's speculation. But if that's true, then yes, he would be a triple agent. Wow. No doubt, a, no doubt a double agent. We can we can count that as valid, you know, but the third, I think, is just speculation. So would he have been feeding you guys and, and the team or the people that you work with false intel? Or how or would he be reporting back to his 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 handlers on the other side about what? what the activities of gamma was that's that was it i believe he, he was uh, reporting back to the Viet Cong. you know what our activities were what our strength was who was who i mean uh, uh indigenous troops that we worked with uh, reported that he was asking questions about each one of us you know and our specialties and and all of these things so this is the kind of detail intel he was collecting it was about us personally it was about our our military operations, you know, that we, you know, our ambush plans and things like, like that, he would report back. As far as what he reported to us, uh, my understanding of that is, is that he never provided any uh, information that would help us in any way uh, confront the enemy. He would provide some accurate information, but it was always too late uh, to catch them. They were there and gone by the time we got word of it. So, you know, that's kind of smart. He's, he's giving information, but it just appears to be coming to him a little bit late, when in fact, he probably knew about it from the start. Now, this is going to be a weird question to ask you. Uh, okay. Um, but did you, did, did you like him? Yeah. That's not weird. I liked him. Of course, we had no clue he was a double agent, right. you know, and, and uh, you know, he was a nice, friendly guy. I think he was about, uh, I think he was about 31, 32, something like that. I don't remember for sure. I was 19 at the time, you know, and uh, we chatted some, you know, he's a family man. Um, he shared some of his history and things like that. So, you know, he, he was just, you know, nice to be around. Yeah. And so I'm going to jump for, well, no, actually I'm not, because I'm, I'm going to carry on with, with some of your personal history, and then we can jump back to talk about what happened to this triple double agent. Okay. Um, and it said that you, uh, you were involved in 22, you know, combat missions, including air, air assault and riverboat mm -hmm. operations, which is quite interesting. I know another um special forces guy he was in uh, mike force and uh he was part of um some boat operations um uh, not not hovercraft uh i can't think of the name now of those things that that they have in florida you know the, the, the you know airboats is, i guess airboats yeah, yeah 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 well yeah. that's what i worked on briefly yeah so you were so you were part of uh, you know assisting gamma and then you were also i guess what i'm trying to ask you is 
what was your role there? Because it seemed like you had multi roles and some of it involved with Gamma and then you were off doing other things or were you always attached to Gamma? Uh, no. Well, of course, Gamma was attached to our A team. Right. That's where that connection came in. Before that, that was my last six months in country. Oh, okay. A team. And uh, Robert Morasco had gotten there about a month before I did. There was a shakeup going on at the team. We had a new commander come in, a uh, couple of other people, or at least one or one I know was replaced. I was a replacement for someone. And uh, that was the last six months of my service. Before that, before moving to the A team, I was at the B team in Maqua. And uh, my primary communication skill was communications. And I was uh, taking and receiving intelligence reports from the A-teams. And um, that's uh, kind of a boring job after a while, <laughs> you, know, you know, and I wanted to get out. And uh, so um, the uh, Airboat Patrol Unit was looking for someone to assist. Uh, Chico Fernandez, uh, uh, was the NCO in charge of that operation in Maqua. And uh, I volunteered to go. I jumped at the chance. You know, uh, Chico was a very experienced um, a veteran, and uh, I liked him. And uh, it provided me an opportunity to get out of the commo shack and get out and actually meet the Vietnamese people. And so I worked with him a few times uh, on, on running the airport patrols. And that's where that experience came in at. And uh, then I was soon assigned to the A team, and that's where Project Gamma was setting up their operation. And at this point um, in your service, had you heard of other, you know, special projects going on? I mean, of course, there was SOG. You guys had heard the rumblings of SOG, but really, it was like, okay, they're doing something, and you don't really want to go there. I think every SOG vet that I've talked to was asked are you sure you want to do that i can put you somewhere a little bit safer right so yeah. so had you heard anything about other special projects at, at this point not in detail but just generally you right. know we knew that those things were going on and uh, when i was leaving the country i had an opportunity you know i was asked if i would be interested in that but i wanted to come home so bad i just said no to everything just get me out of here <laughs> you know? right yeah. Yeah, we were aware of them, but not in detail. Right. Kind of whispers there, right? Yeah. Um, well, at least at least as far as I'm concerned. Right. You know, now, our, I don't know. Al Kittredge was our team captain. Uh, you might find him an interesting fellow to talk to sometime. Uh, he might have known more much about it than I did, of course. You know, so. you know what? I mean, this is uh, one thing I try and do is um, try and encourage people if you know, you know, a veteran or you have one in your family, um, just be polite and be and, and be respectful and just say, I simply like to know anything that you wish to share because um, everyone's getting getting older. Right. And that's right. You know, the history is uh, is going to be lost if if we don't do things mm -hmm. like this. Right. I've always said that. I've always said, man, you know, tell your story yeah. because it is important. You know, and uh, when I told mine, uh, it wasn't to sell a book. It, it was for family and friends who had questions, you know. And, uh, of course, back during the day, uh, when I came back from Nam, it was uh, late 1969. And, uh, uh, you know, it was an unpopular war uh, in some circles. And uh, nobody really talked about anything. And uh, a lot of the Vietnam veterans just kind of closed up, you know, within themselves, and they've gone years and years and years without ever expressing anything about it. But it's important for the individual to be able to share those things. And uh, I would suggest, if I'm not out of line, uh, that if anyone listening does know a troubled Vietnam veteran, the best therapy is to just let him talk. Just, just get him to talk and just listen to him. That's the best therapy possible. But other than that, uh, yeah, it's for the sake of posterity. You know, we need to preserve the history. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know what? And um, I've only, 
I've only done probably 10 of these, maybe 15. Um, and I have a few of my books out. And so I've had, and I've known a lot of uh, special forces guys and the ones who've done these interviews, whether with me or with others say is kind of like um, not therapy, but it's so good that a younger yeah. generation want to hear these stories. Like you just said, That's right. that yeah. being closed off and um, you know, really putting all your gear away in your closet, growing your hair out longer just to fit in. I don't want it like, you know, you want to blend in as soon as possible. Right. You don't want to have that crew cut or whatever. <laughs> right. So um, to jump back here, um, interesting uh, because you were involved with the, uh, I've got to find it here. Uh, new, new I'll, I'll try and pronounce this new Cody. How, how do you pronounce it? That the, the uh, mountain range there and N U I C O. You Cody. Okay. Yeah. And so that I know uh, from other people, that was quite a big uh, Mike Force Special Forces operation, it was. right? Yes, yes, it was. Can you tell us a little bit of, about that? Because it said that you were like, you know, you were taken out of there, uh, you know, evacuated. Yeah. So um, yeah, yeah, I was med medevaced out. Uh, it uh, uh, our team had a specific responsibility in our area of operation, but when the need is great, you know, you have to. You know, you, you can get used elsewhere. So we didn't participate in the initial assault on Yuri Koto by any stretch, but there was always the cleanup after that, the stragglers, you know, the, the snipers that still remained. And, and there was a affordable force still there after the major assault. So special forces uh, drew from different teams at different times to spend some time on near, near Koto. And uh, members of my team were summoned. So those of us who were ordered there, we did. We, you know, we were we were flown into New Ikoto, and our objective was to patrol, you know, to round up uh, any stragglers or or uh, to eliminate any hostiles, and uh, you know, just normal normal things that a soldier does. Mopping up. I know. I know that's another uh, newer expression, yeah. right? You know. Yeah, mopping up. Yeah. Yeah. So it says yeah. here also that you that you commanded dozens of, of ambush, uh, um, uh, you know, patrols. Um, and so at this, uh, so you are or if not, uh, are at least one of the youngest so soldiers to ever be in the special forces, right? I am now. Yeah. Let me clarify that now. Now, I did not go through the Q course. And you can not serve on a Special Forces A team without going through the Q course anymore. The, there have been a lot of changes that are made. This was back in 1968 when there was a need for it. Right. And uh, um, I was uh, uh, PCS to Special Forces. That means a permanent change of station. There is a TDY assignment, which is temporary duty. You can be assigned to a unit and not be a part of the unit. But my orders were PCS, permanent change. So I was as much a special forces soldier as anyone else. And uh, I had met their qualifications. You know, they reviewed all my records and everything before they ever selected me. So <clears throat> I don't know where I was going here. Uh, what was the question? Uh, oh, that, no, that's, that, that answers that. Just about being uh, one of the youngest. Uh, one oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Now, that's true. I was 18 years old. And uh, there were other 18-year-olds who were also assigned to, to Vietnam with special forces. Uh, but as far as we can determine, and I've talked to a lot of people that may have made claims publicly about the same thing, and they don't hold up. They, they can offer no evidence or you know, whatever. But as far as we can determine, I am the youngest soldier to serve on a special forces A team and earn the infantryman infantryman combat badge yeah yeah if i could talk so yeah and i was 19 years and 19 days old when that happened wow so uh, that's uh you know that's that's you know that and five dollars to get me a cup of coffee but <laughs> it's oh, just cool. a thing, little footnote you know yeah no that's a great uh a great, uh, uh, you know, bookmark for your for your career. Um, well, if, any, if anyone can provide 
evidence that they were the youngest. I mean, real evidence, you know, yeah. DOD records and things like that, not right. just a certificate of something. You know, they need they need military records. If right. I can confirm that they were younger than that, I'll I'll quickly, you know, make the change. But as as it is right now, I'll I'll owe to that that I am the youngest Green Beret to serve one in the A-team and earn the combat badge. There's a, a, a picture of Terry when Whoa, he was younger. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was uh, 18. That was taken just before I went to Vietnam. I was home on leave wow. uh, from Germany. Yeah. So now we're going to get to to the to what happened to the agent. I, I would rather that you that you tell it because me reading it or reading uh, documentation doesn't really I am I am nobody I'm I, I'm a historian so could you so we've established that this individual was a double agent um, and we can establish that you know Project Gamma was a, a CIA run operation correct that's true okay so um, there was a what I will lead into this is there was a situation um, that the gamma heads went to the CIA handlers or whatever you want to call them. And this is where I'm going to turn it over to you because they had a problem that had to be rectified. And this is where it spirals. So what, what, what was the problem? Well, uh, well, initially, uh, Bob Moresco, who was the, uh, officer in charge of project gamma there, he was suspicious of uh, Ju In in the first place. Uh, and he's told me that he should have never been sent out on patrols with me. But see, I, I, I managed a lot of ambush patrols out of the FOB area. And uh, that's where I first met Ju In because our, we had trouble keeping translators. Uh, and uh, our last one had just been killed. So we didn't have anybody. And uh, so we borrowed him from uh, the B team. He, uh, his handler was Alvin Smith. Um, and uh, Alvin really liked Juin, thought a lot of him. And uh, according to all that I understand, he never did a full investigation on Juin's background. Juin made claims about working for this and that, and you know, but just not really verified. Moresco was a little bit suspicious, suspicious from the beginning. Hmm. Excuse me. But uh, uh, that's where I met him out uh, at the FOB. And he accompanied me on several ambush patrols. And uh, fortunately, you know, we didn't engage with the enemy except for one time together. And um, on this particular incident, uh, Alvin Smith wrote about it in his memoirs, which uh, I can't think of the name of the book. His uh, his former wife wrote it and included his memoirs in it. Uh, but uh, there had been a number of attacks on the city of Makwa. And, you know, it's really tragic when those things happen. Women and children are dying, innocent people. And uh, it began to look like that those attacks, although they, they couldn't be pinpointed where they were coming from, uh, it was decided that they were coming from 414's area of operation. That was ours. Yeah. Well, we didn't like that. You know, so, you know, we wanted to do something about it. We wanted to catch those guys. And uh, we knew they would be coming across the border, you know, to put themselves within range, you know, where they could launch it. And uh, it was a rapid fire attack every night. It was, you know, 10, 15 rounds fired and they were gone. They were like ghosts. And nobody could really pinpoint them. So, uh, because of, of of that, we were setting up ambush patrols more regularly out, you know, around the border area. And uh, Juan and I were out, and he had. Well, let me get it straight. In my mind. It's been a while. The report was that there was to be uh, another attack coming, and. Juin somehow or other was involved with that, with uh, making, uh, you know, the authorities known about it. And uh, so he and I went out together. Now, Morasco says he never knew that this was happening at the time. It wasn't cleared through him. 
And, uh, but it was running out of our FOB. So we kind of made our own decisions there. You know, we're out by ourselves and we kind of you know, did what we thought. But Smith sent him out to the FOB and he and I went out uh, on the ambush together. And uh, sure enough, uh, we caught him coming across the line and we opened fire on them. And uh, they didn't fire back. They turned and they ran back towards Cambodia. And uh, uh, it just wasn't acceptable, you know, for that to happen. And uh, so I made a quick decision and it, it was maybe foolish, but you know, I'm 19 years old and I'm mad at these people. And, and uh, I didn't think of them as being humans anyway, because they were murderers and we wanted to eliminate them. So uh, I noticed though that Chu uh when I handed him the, the starlight scope, which you're probably familiar with, where you could see better in, in the dark, he just kind of smiled. It was kind of weird that he smiled, and uh, but I didn't think too much about it at the moment. But when they took off back towards Cambodia, it was kind of like an instinct, you know, we got to get these guys. So uh, I'm trying to call back uh, to the FOB for mortar support, and I can't get anything. It's just dead air, which is, you know, really weird. And uh, so I just made a decision, we're going we're gonna to chase them. So QN didn't have any option but to go with me on that. You know, I know he didn't want to, but he didn't have an option. And so we did, we took off and uh, chased them up to a tree line, which they disappeared into. And I wasn't about to run into a tree line like that. So, but we lined up beside each other, you know, I ordered a execution fire and we all started walking toward the tree line, emptying our, our weapons into it. And uh, Juin was my, to my left. And he was fiddling with his M16, like, you know, hey, something's wrong with it. And uh, they still didn't fire back, so I halted the group. We're standing there for about a second. And then that's when they opened up on us from within the tree line. And we're out in the open, of course. So, you know, we the best option to survive is to get out of there. So we took off. And, uh, oh, you still have me there? Yep. I lost you for a second. That's okay. All right. Yeah, we uh, escaped and invaded the uh, the counter ambush, made our way to a safe area, and I still couldn't make any contact with the FOB on the radio, but they could see all the action from a distance. You know, the, the uh, tracers flying back right. and forth, right. so they knew contact was made. And they were trying to call me and they couldn't get me. So they feared that I was either injured or possibly even dead. And uh, uh, so the camp commander, Al Kittredge, made a command decision to have them uh, go ahead and launch into the preset coordinates, which was along that same tree line. And so they did that anyway, without knowing for sure where we were at or what was going on. And they did an excellent job. They took out that tree line, you know, really good. And we're sitting at a safer distance watching them do that. And uh, things went very quiet. There was nothing else that happened that night. We got back the next morning and did a radio check and discovered that the frequency dial had been switched to a different frequency. Now, how does that happen? You know, you check everything before you go out, you're in communication when you're in there. Uh, and then suddenly, you know, it was switched. So it's, it's very suspicious, and uh, it would have been very easy for anyone, particularly Chu in, to have reached up behind the back of the soldier packing the uh, radio and switched it, you know, as we set up the ambush. He knew they were going to be coming through. You know, he was, he was acting ahead, you know, preventing us having any communication probably thinking that, well, it'd be a minor skirmish. He would look good to uh, Project Gamma, you know, and uh, things would go well for him. What he didn't plan on was a 19-year-old silly kid saying, hey, that ain't good enough. We're going to chase him. You know? So that added an element he didn't expect. But it looked like he could have been the one. And I asked him about his weapon, and he said that it jammed. What do you do? I mean, you know, the M16 has been known to jam, so, you know, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But it just all looks suspicious anyway. 
And uh, so with Morasco's other concerns, that was, you know, a, a double whammy there. That didn't really uh, cause anything to happen except to add more suspicion to it. Uh, other reports begin to come in from local agents who were identifying him as a double agent. Wow. And, and Morasco's agents begin to disappear. They didn't want to work. They didn't want to be in the camp because of Chu Hen's presence. And uh, then, of course, there was a photo found by another Nikon team in Cambodia. Right. Which uh, is a very famous photo today. You can find it pretty easily, I guess, online. Uh, but he was with the uh, Viet Cong officers and with his arm around him. And uh, he was positively identified by his handler, uh, Mr. Smith, and also, uh, you know, Morasco. So that was, you know, the nail in the coffin. The suspicions had led up to that. And so arrangements were made for him to be arrested and interrogated. Uh, he never admitted being a spy, but he failed the, the polygraph test. And... Um, uh, from that point on, they didn't really know what to do with him. And uh, they had consulted with the CIA uh, about it and uh, basically told, you know, terminate with extreme pre pre prejudice. And uh, that's a term that's famous now today. Yeah. But uh, so they did. They made arrangements to execute him. Uh, Morasco and two other gamma operatives whom... I wouldn't have any idea who were, or didn't have any contact with them at all. The decision was not known to us at the team. We weren't a part of that, but they made a decision to execute him. And uh, the option being elimination the best because he knew a lot of things he shouldn't be telling the enemy. And putting him in a Vietnamese prison was very, very risky because there was a lot of spies and things that went on. So they decided that was the best course of, of action. And so they did that. They did uh, take him out in a boat and they executed him and dumped his body in the South China Sea. And uh, then I think it was the next day after that, they received a fax from the CIA headquarters saying, uh, that's not a good option. <laughs> Well, somebody changed their mind for some reason at some point. And of course, I'm not privy to all of that because you know, it didn't involve me. But uh, the story is thus. So uh, Sergeant Smith uh, alerted uh, others about what happened because he became paranoid. He was the only one who really objected to the execution. And uh, he was a good friend of Chuan as well. But uh, he reported the incident, uh, thinking that his own life was in danger, that uh, Morasco and the other men would execute him too. Now, that's been investigated, and there was no evidence of that claim to be found anywhere. So uh, they were exonerated from that claim. But that was his thinking anyway, whatever state of mind he had at the time. And uh, that opened up the, you know, it became public knowledge. And when uh, Creighton Adams, you know, the, the uh, army commander, he, he got, you know, that, well, he didn't like special forces anyway, they say. So he came down real hard on it and uh, had them arrested. And uh, then, of course, the media got hold of all that, and that's where it became a firestorm. And so what, what, when did you learn of Juin's, you know, disappearance or like when, first of all, when did you realize that he wasn't around anymore? And then when did you realize that the man that you had gone on operations with, that he was now terminated? Well, yeah. Um, as far as him not being around, I, he was around and not around. So it wasn't a big noticeable thing for me. And we weren't always in the same place. Okay. You know? So that wasn't anything. But um, uh, when a decision was made to arrest him, one of... Uh, one of Morasco's men, his his uh, uh, agent, really, uh, talked to me about it. Uh, he didn't give me all the details, but he let me know that something really big was coming down. 
And uh, he was trying to prepare me for that because, you know, he knew about my connection with chewing and everything else. So, and, uh, and uh, people need people to talk to. And he was like a big brother to me anyway. So, you know, he confided that much in about it with me. And so I was expecting something to happen. And I asked him, I said, well, uh, how will they handle this? And he said, well, he'll be called in, he'll be arrested and, uh, you know, and sent to prison. Now, did he know better? I don't know, you know, whether he was just telling me that or whether that's what he thought too as well. I don't know, but uh, that's what I expected to have happen. And uh, then I went back to the forward ob observation base for a week or so and uh, came back and uh, Project Gamma was gone. They had been uh, airlifted out. You know, no goodbyes or anything, just, just gone. And uh, uh, that's because they were placed under arrest. And uh, so I didn't see them again uh, until many, many years later. And, uh, uh, but as I was nearing end of my tour at that time, this is in July, they were arrested. No, Chuan was killed in June and they were arrested in July. I think I had a couple of weeks left on duty there i'm not sure but uh when i was checking out they were actually being jailed and i didn't know that i didn't know where they were but then i was you know summoned uh, you know to be interviewed to see what i knew about anything and i did not acknowledge of everything um, got back home uh, and then uh i think it was uh yeah I had a 30 day leave. I think, I guess it was somewhere towards the end of that. There was in the news, the local newspaper in Paducah, Kentucky, even, which is, you know, um, it's just mostly local news and things like that. But it was a story in there about these Green Berets being arrested. And I'm like, okay, that's what happened. And uh, I'll make it to my new duty station, which, uh, I had opted out of staying with special forces. They gave me an option to stay or go. And I told them I wanted to go. So we went, uh, I, I was reassigned to the 75th infantry, which was my old unit reforged stateside. And, uh, which was, you know, I was very familiar with many the folks there. So when I got to my new assignment, then, uh, within a month or so, I saw, a news report about it on and all just kind of clicked. Okay. Wow. That's what they did with you. <laughs> yeah. And so were you, uh, it, it sounds so when I do these interviews, like I, I want to say like five things at the same time. So I, I got to okay. slow myself down. Okay. It sounds like you weren't that you knew with you in that something was uh, awry and it sounds like you weren't, totally surprised that that he was up to something is that correct that you oh yeah yeah okay. yeah, yeah well yeah after that ambush incident with him uh you know although he explained it away it's you know with with the other suspicions you yeah. know that Moresco had it was, there was some suspicion at that point but not before we didn't have a clue you know or i didn't <laughs> anyway you know but uh uh it was after that incident that uh there was, I knew that there was probably something, but I, I wasn't concrete. Yeah. yeah. And I guess yeah. that one thing that the public need to know is that with the military, that you guys have uh, rules of engagement where the CIA really have a, a free run to do whatever they choose is in their best, best interest, right? Um, well, they are in their best interest yeah. because they, they hung these officers out yeah. to cry for this. You know, and uh, Bob Moresco, now he's passed away recently, uh, but I, I didn't know him to be a liar. I didn't know, I, you know, I, I just didn't know him that way at all. And uh, he maintained, you know, that they were acting on what they considered orders, you know, to eliminate the man. But then when Abrams got involved, the public got involved, the CIA didn't. They didn't do that. You know, well, according to them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So who's going to be held responsible? Yeah. The, the officers who followed the orders were uh, considered to be working on their own. 
you know, just Rogue. acting like uh, gangsters or something, you know. It wasn't the case at all, as, as far as I can determine by any of it. So that was uh, a sad part of it, but uh, it's kind of a wake-up call. Um, and now that uh, I do recall seeing Time Life, um, that the colonel there, uh, he's with his wife, and they're walking walking away, and he's like, okay, the court case is over, I've been cleared, right? So they were all cleared of any wrongdoing, and it wasn't career, it was not career ending for him, correct? Well, it was. Oh, it was. You know, okay. they, they weren't really clear. The, the charges were just dropped. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, if you have seen our team documentary about this, there's an interview in there by one of the attorneys who represented them. Right. I've seen that, yeah. And uh, yeah, well, uh, Colonel Roll, who had just taken command of 5th of Special Forces, uh, by the way, he did fly out our team once and uh, just before all this broke out. But um, they weren't, the, he, he concocted a false story about Chuan's disappearance uh, to protect the officers who did that. Now, that's, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's a great commander. All right. But uh, uh, when, when Abrams found out that he had lied to him, you know, that, that was one of the reasons that Abrams got so enraged. But the charges, uh, they were never clear. The charges were dropped because, uh, well, defense attorneys were saying, okay, if you're going to do this, we're going to demand to see some records here. And the CIA didn't want to open up some things. But it went even higher. It went to Richard Nixon, the wow. president. Yeah. And uh, he wouldn't let the CIA testify. Um, <laughs> that's a different story altogether about what I know about that. Right. End of it. But it's mostly hearsay to me. And, uh, but uh, anyway, he did uh, prevent the CIA from testifying. So there was no case to be made. There was no missing person, no, no body to be found. Right. Uh, yeah. And uh, nobody was going to testify. So all the charges were dropped. Didn't clear them. It left them in an, uh, a place of suspicion, you know, did they oh, really God. do this horrible thing? You know, did an American soldier kill an enemy who was responsible for American and civilian deaths? You know, that was <laughs> to me is so ironic that such a charge would even be brought. Uh, because from my in my mindset, assassinating that enemy soldier is probably equivalent to setting up an ambush. And the enemy walking through it, yeah. and you eliminating them. I don't. I don't. In my mind, I can't see the difference. You know. So if it's okay to do one, what's you know yeah. what's wrong doing the other? But I mean, all of it's horrible. I'm not. I'm not yeah. defending any anything like that. It's all horrific. But uh, you know, it, it just seemed unreasonable that they were ever even charged in the first place. But uh, it did. Uh, um, uh, Tarnish. Yeah, he did tarnish. That's the word. Uh, Colonel Rowe resigned. He knew he would go no further. He wouldn't get his general star. You know, so he retired and went on to live a successful civilian life. Uh, Robert Morasco also resigned his commission and uh, went back home. The, I'm not sure about the other gamma operatives who were in on it, you know, from an right. administrative point of view, I don't know exactly what happened to them, but uh, others were reassigned. So uh, as we're heading towards the end of this first hour, and I like to keep them to an hour, doesn't mean that you, can, sure. that you can't come back. Um, but as you say, yeah. Yeah. Um, what did Terry do after he came back to the States? How did your life, I want to hear about your life and, and, and how you, where you are today. Well, oh, well, initially I went back at, uh, with the 75th Rangers and uh, served the rest of my tour in the army and uh, got married. Let me plug this in real quick. Sure. So, battery's running low. Don't want it to die on us right here. Side down, they do the other side. 
There we go. Yeah. Uh, well, after I got out of the army, you know, I just did uh, several different little jobs. Not really. I actually have wondered how Vietnam might have impacted my attitude, you know, at that time, because I was very young and uh, I had seen death happen so quickly, you know. Yeah. And yeah. nobody expects to die the morning they get up. And I realized that life is so short. I didn't have, I didn't place value on planning ahead too much. You know, I was just day by day because tomorrow is not secure. And so I'm just going to enjoy today. So I was, uh, even though I was working and paying bills and things like that, I just wasn't a man with ambition. I was just living. And uh, eventually uh, things changed. I uh, did go through a divorce, but today I'm happily married and have beautiful wife and uh, uh, three children and eight grandchildren. Wow. So, well, that's, all that's turned out well. Uh, eventually, after working for a national company for several years as a wholesaler, uh, my wife and I both felt a call into the ministry. We're Christians. And uh, so we have served overseas for the last 30, 32 years. Wow. Uh, proclaiming the gospel to uh, the people of Palestine and Israel. And uh, we turned all that over eventually to local ministers. And uh, today I'm retired and we still manage, we purchased and managed a 24-7 uh, a, uh, Christian television program, which is broadcasting the gospel into Palestine daily. And uh, so I managed that from here. Wow. As far as programming is concerned. And the other than that, we're retired and enjoying life. Well, that's cool. It's always good. It's always good to know what people or people did after they came home. Right. I mean, um, I never want to focus just on the actual military aspect of someone's life. Um, and so if people want to uh, track your book down, um, where can they find it? Well, that would be really appreciated. Uh, it's on Amazon. Uh, okay. It's as an ebook or paperback. Uh, the name of it is uh, The Youngest Green Beret by Terry McIntosh. And any, any purchase is appreciated. And now also, um, where I found out a great deal of your information is you actually have a lot of your, which is, which is great. I must say that you, you have your, you know, a lot of your bio, your military, you know, like you're a very open book, you know, literally. Yeah. Literally, yeah. right? Um, yeah. and so if people want to look up your bio, um, what I will do is I will add that link um, at, at, at the end. Um, and I will also uh, put a link to, to your book. Okay, so, that's great. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Well, so maybe we can, we'll, we'll end this one for today. Um, thank you for bearing with me and, uh -huh. uh, you know, for all the technical difficulties. So, um, uh, but next time, let's, let's do another chat. Um, I'd like to do two. It's hard to compress someone's life into uh, an, an hour, right? But, oh, you uh, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Terry. Well, thank you very much, and we'll and we'll talk to you soon. All right, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye, Terry.